Well, basically, I only want to read one text tonight. Book of the Revelation, chapter 3. But we were referring through the letters, of course, because we've been studying them line by line and word by word almost in detail for two months now. But I think there's no question that verse 22 of chapter 3 sums up the Lord's challenge to us regarding all the teaching. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. If you can hear, listen. Mark it carefully. Study it wisely. Mull it over. Consider it. Meditate upon it. It's absolutely vital. If you have an ear, hear what the Spirit saith unto the seven churches. Seven times the verse is repeated, the perfect number in Scripture. God does nothing by chance. God never did anything by chance and never will. It is not His nature. In all God's dealings, you can trace a design. You can see eventually, as a believer, a purpose and a plan. In the orbiting of a planet, there is design. In the shape and structure of a fly's wings, there is design. In every single verse of the Bible, there is design. And there's design in every repetition of this statement in each letter to the seven churches. Wherever it takes place, and whenever it takes place, it is not there by chance. Seven times. It had a meaning then that was intended by God to be observed. It has a meaning now in the 20th century in this city, at this time, at this moment, at this night, at this very place, and to you watching and listening wherever you are across the world, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. This verse appears to call special attention of all true Christians everywhere. It was meant to make believers take particular notice of things which the seven letters contain, and it still has the same meaning to us today. In fact, as we have seen in these studies, here are lessons that we cannot know too well. If I were to begin again, and for the next two months go through it again, line by line, precept upon precept, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, it would still have power, maybe even greater power. No matter how many times you go through it, we could not know these messages too well. They bear repetition. It's fascinating to observe that our Lord Jesus, in all seven letters, doesn't say anything to any church about church government. Nothing in any of the seven letters about ordinances. He makes no mention anywhere of forms of worship. He doesn't instruct John to write one word about baptism. Not one word about the Lord's Supper. Not one word about how the meetings of the local church should be governed and guided, by what principles they should function. 
Not a word about form of worship or ordinance or government. Isn't that fascinating? And I think there's a purpose in that because you see it is a warning us that men and women and boys and girls and young people who are saved by God's grace and born again of the Spirit, that means that they have personally received the Lord Jesus as their very own friend and Savior. It's not just a religion to them. They know Him personally. They have received Him as their very own Savior. As Jesus said, to as many says God's word has received him, to them gives he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. It's saying to people like that, and to people who aren't like that, that we must never be content with the outward form of what people call religion. We must not rest on church membership. We must not rest on local church privileges. He or she is not a Christian who is one outwardly. It is rather that you must be born again. There must be a new creation by the Spirit of God in your heart. It is in the inward, and you can't search these letters, folks, but not see that that's what God was saying. It's not the outward form that God is concerned about in these letters. It's what's within. And these are the kind of things he dwells upon when writing seven times over to seven different churches. I remember a friend of mine saying to me once, you could have a local church gathered and it be absolutely correct on every doctrine and in its functioning and in its government and still not have power in it. And many a time I have thought of that. In every epistle, the Lord is talking about what you are inside, not what is outward. That's why the letters are so searching. In every letter, the Lord Jesus says these sharp, powerful words, I know thy works. If you've got an ear to hear, now listen to me, he says seven times. And then he says seven times to seven different churches and to us, I know your works. I know them. That repeated expression is really very striking. It's not for nothing that we read these words seven times over. To one church, the Lord says, I know thy labor. To another church, he says, I know your poverty. To another church, he says, I know your persecuted. To another church, he says, I know you're weak. To another church, he says, you're wretched and you're poor and you're miserable and you're blind and you don't know it and you think you're rich and you think you have everything and you think you're upright and you think you're powerful and so on, but you're not because I know you. I know you through and through. You can't fool me. You may fool others, but you'll not fool me. I won't have it. To some he commands, to other, others he doesn't command. To one love, to another service, to another faith. You've got great faith, some of you. You've got great service for me. To, to others, you've got great love. But to every single one of them, he says, I know, I know you, and I know your works. It's not I know your profession, what you talk about. He knows that too. Doesn't say, I know all the desires you have as local churches, and he knew that too. Doesn't say, I know all the resolutions you've made, that you're going to be this and that and the other. No. It's not even he says, I know your wishes. He says, I know your works. I know how you behave behind closed doors and in front of them, in your heart and in your mind. I know you. You see, the works of a professing Christian are of very great importance. You know that works cannot save your soul. If works could save your soul, then why did Jesus have to suffer and die at Calvary? But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. You know that works will not save you. 
You know that works cannot justify you. You know tonight as you look into my face and listen to God's word being preached that works will not wipe out your sins. You know that works, good works, cannot save you from the wrath of God. But it doesn't follow because they cannot save you that they are of no importance. Take heed and beware, says J.C. Ryle, of such a notion. The Bishop of Liverpool passed. The person, he says, who thinks so is fearfully deceived. And I agree. You see, a person's works are evidence of a person's faith. If you call yourself a Christian, you have to show it by your daily way and your daily behavior. The faith of Abraham in the Bible, the faith of Rahab, was proved by their works. Every tree, said Jesus, is known by its own fruit. Whatever the works of a professing Christian may be, Jesus says, I know them. I know them. Works won't save you. I was telling some children in a school this morning about the bishop's wife up there in Londonderry when she wrote those amazing words. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. Jesus saves, not our works. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But that doesn't mean to say that the works are unimportant. His eyes are in every place, beholding both the evil and the good. I never did an action. You never did an action, however private, but your Lord saw it. I never spoke a word, whether it was pillow talk, whether it was talk on the street or in the car, however private or public, but that the Lord heard it. You never wrote a letter, even to your dearest friend, but the Lord read it. You never thought a thought, however secret, but that the Lord was familiar with it. His eyes, we read in these letters, are as of a flaming fire. The darkness is no darkness with him. All things are open and manifest before him. He says to every person here tonight, I know your works. Lord Jesus knows the works, you see, of unbelieving souls, and he'll punish them. They are not forgotten in heaven, though they may be forgotten on earth. In fact, thoughts are heard in heaven. When the great white throne is set, and the unbeliever stands before it, and the books are opened, and the dead will be judged according to their works, where will you stand, friend? And you sang Top Lady's hymn, Rock of Ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin a double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. But you didn't trust it alone for salvation. You trusted your own works. And it won't stand the test of God. My friend, this is a very serious message from God tonight. God will punish the unbeliever's sin. Terrible, isn't it? Those who have not trusted the Savior personally have no hiding place. They are defenseless. And if they die like that, they'll perish. But then the Lord not only will judge the sins and the works of the unbeliever, he will judge according to Scripture at the judgment seat of Christ, his own people. And he will weigh their works. He'll weigh them. By him, says the Bible, 
our actions wed. He knows the whys and the wherefores of the deeds of your life. He sees the motives of every single step you take. He discerns how much is done for his sake and how much is done for the sake of praise. He knows your works and he weighs them. And his weighing is just. The Lord hateth a false weight, you know, and a false balance, the proverb says. And the Lord knows, the Lord knows the works of all his own people. And one day, he will reward them. You say, honestly, honestly. The Lord never overlooks a kind word. He never overlooks a kind deed done in his name. If you love the Lord Jesus and you follow him, you may be sure that your work and your labor shall not be in vain in the Lord. The works of those that die, the Scripture says, shall follow them. Shall follow them. All the works that believers have done for him will be owned by Christ. Every single one of them. The parable of the pounds will be made good. Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Nobody, says one writer, is a whole chain. Each one is a link. Take away one link and the chain is broken. Nobody is a whole team. Each one is a player. Take away one player and the game is forfeited. Nobody is a whole orchestra. Each one is a musician. But take away one musician and the symphony is incomplete. Nobody is a whole play. Each one is an actor. But take away one actor and the performance suffers. Nobody is a whole hospital. Each one is part of the staff. But take away one person, and it isn't long until the patient can tell that that person is gone. Cars are composed of numerous parts. Each one is connected to and dependent upon the other. Even a tiny screw, if it comes loose, can eventually cause the car to stop or to crash. And you've guessed it, we need each other. You need someone, and somebody in this city or province tonight needs you. Somebody needs you. You say, honestly, honestly. Isolated islands, we are not. To make this thing called life work, we've got to lean and support each other. We've got to relate to each other. We've got to respond to each other. We've got to give. We've got to take. We've got to confess. We've got to forgive. We've got to reach out. We've got to embrace. We've got to release. We've got to let go. We've got to rely. All interacting within the life of the church and the community, especially God's family, you know. Love each other with brotherly affection, the Scripture says, and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically, says one translation. Be glad for all that God is planning for you. Be patient in trouble. Be prayerful always. When God's children are in need, you must be the one to help them out. 
and get into the habits of inviting guests home to dinner or if they need lodging for the night. Romans 12, 10 to 13. A lot of truth right there. Why? Because each one of us is worth it. Even when we don't act like it or feel like it or deserve it, it's important. It's important that you understand that in God's sight, what you do and how you act, even in the tiniest degree, is vital and will be rewarded. You know, the Wall Street Journal had a poem once, and this is what it said. How important are you? Well, more than you think. A rooster minus a hen equals no baby chicks, and Kellogg minus a farmer equals no cornflakes. And if the nail factory closes, what good is the hammer factory? And, and Schubert's genius wouldn't have amounted to much if the piano tuner hadn't turned up. And a cracker maker will do better if there's a cheese maker. Even Jacobs would tell you that. And the most skillful surgeon needs an ambulance driver to get his patient delivered to him. And Rogers needed Hammerstein. And you need someone. And someone needs you. And I want you all, for many of you are getting caught up in the fast lane of this 20th century. And many of you have trusted the Savior is your very own, but you're losing a sense of your identity and how vital your life is and your service for the Lord. No work, said an old African missionary to me once, is insignificant if it is done for God. And I want you to get a hold of it and always remember it. You know, none of us is an independent, self-sufficient, super-capable, all-powerful hotshot. None of us. Let's stop acting as if we all were and that we didn't need each other. We need each other, and we need each other vitally in these days. Let's get down to the reality of this. And because we need each other, the Lord knows our works. When you reach out, brother, to help that other brother or whatever, or Christian, you reach out to help the lost or those who are in need. Nobody might ever see it but him and that person, but it will not be without its reward. You say, but look, Derek, I don't see much beauty in any action I do. Well, let me tell you something, neither do I see much beauty in actions I do either. I'm sure you're just like me. Sometimes you put your head in your hands and you say, Oh, Lord, I am no better, like Elijah said, than my fathers. Just take me away home, Lord, said Elijah. I'd rather die now if you don't mind. Just take me on home now. Well, maybe you haven't got that far yet, but that's how far he got, and we're going to see that in the study of his life. He got to a stage in his life for God when he said, Look, I'm not making any impact for God. My life is insignificant. What am I? I'd rather be dead. Maybe you feel like that tonight. You see no beauty, Christian, in any action that you do. All seems blemished and defiled and fouled up. And you're often sick at heart at your own shortcomings, aren't we all? And you say, that verse goes through me like a sword. I know thy works, and the Lord knows my works, and what could he find even in my life for him that would have any significance? Just a minute. Just a minute. Maybe you think your life of every day of it is either, it's, it's always blotted by something that's wrong. But you see, Know now in God's presence that the Lord Jesus can see beauty in your life. You see, how could he? 
because he knows the desire of your heart. I know hundreds of you and talk to hundreds of you through these nearly 10 years. And I know many of you who are frustrated with your lives for God and say they're not making much impact for God and what use am I? But oh, I have listened and been moved dozens and dozens of times by your desire to serve the Lord, your conscientious desire to delight yourself in the Lord and in his things. You think the Lord doesn't see that? You not think that the Lord saw David's burning desire when he lived in a beautiful cedar-beamed house of his own? He said, Lord, what am I doing in this house when you, you're, you're dwelling in a tent, a tabernacle, a tent? I want to build you a far better house than I've got to dwell in. God said, sorry, David, count your hands are stained with blood. You're a man of war. You can't build that temple you so desire. But I will let you make the plans for it or whatever or, or pass on the vision you have for it and somebody else will build it. In fact, as far as God was concerned, he saw the desire of David's heart, even though David never got to doing the actual great work that his vision was to do. And maybe old friend tonight or younger friend or older friend, you have a desire to do some great thing for God, but it never came. And maybe it never will come, and somebody else will do it. And outwardly, they'll get the glory for it, but not in God's book. Oh, I know in my old age, I'm guilty of repeating myself too often, perhaps. After all, I am 40 now, folks as you so nicely reminded me by your singing last week. Thank you for that happy birthday song you all sang and for your kindness. But you know, I don't want to just go on repeating myself, but it always touches me, the story of the missionary going around the world for God or part of the world, and he came home and the starlet was on the boat, you know, with her furs and all the rest of it in those days and razzmatazz of the of the press there to meet her. Going down that gang plank, the press wanted to hear what she had to say and the old missionary leaning out over the edge of the boat. And he felt sick at heart and the devil says, look, you've wasted your life. There isn't even anybody to meet you. Nobody has even come to welcome you home. Ah, but as the missionary was walking down the gang plank, a little voice seemed to whisper in his ear these precious words. Ah, but you are not home yet. And Christian, that is true. Look at these letters. Every one of them are pointing in some way or other to the eternal state. You're not home yet. And maybe what you had a desire in your heart to do for the Lord, maybe your son or daughter will do it. My mother took me up in her arms when my twin brother died two days after he was born and said, Lord, if this baby is not going to be used, as she put it, in full-time service, then take him away now. I want him for you and for your people. That's all. If he's not going to do that, I'd rather you take him now. Few mothers pray like that. But she was dead before I came into the Lord's work as I'm in it now and left aside other things to give myself, excuse the eye, and drawing attention to self. But it's true. I'm only saying here tonight, I am rising up and I am calling my mother blessed. And maybe there are dozens of mothers here tonight, girls who in 10 years will have families of their own. Will you remember this word? that I give you tonight, you may never reach what you call a mission field. God may have other plans for you. It's like Ruth Graham said when they were thrown out of China or whatever, her father was a surgeon. She married Billy and she said, I wanted to be a missionary in China, but God sent me to be a missionary to five little children in North Carolina. 
her own children, one of whom now is in the Lord's work and others in various forms of the Lord's work, as I understand it. There's no telling where your children will go and what will become of them. You say, no. I had a mother on the phone with me today just telling me how that she was so thrilled to see the things of God coming coming out of her son's life. And she'd prayed for him all her days and long before he was born. And now he's beginning to come out and go for God. And she can hardly believe that the Lord has answered his prayer. That's the beauty of this class. It is my great privilege and the privilege of the elders of this church under whose earthly authority I am given authority to preach here tonight. As we move together forward in this church and its membership. It is our great privilege here at the Crescent to be allowed to feed you when so many of you are at a vital stage in your lives. Oh, watch how you behave. As you leave this place and go home, watch how you go home. Watch where you go. Watch what you do. Watch what you say. Future generations are involved as to how you go now, the standards you set now, the love you have for God and his things. Oh, learn it now before you have to break your heart to learn it, or your heart is broken before you learn it, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. There's no telling what God will do with your life although you see it as insignificant now. Jesus can see some beauty in your desire as you lay your life out for him now. And you may not. His eye can discern excellence in the very least little thing that is the fruit of his own spirit in your life, the very tiniest little spark of divine life in your soul. He can see it. He can pick out the grains of gold from the dross of your life and the dross of my life. He can sift through the wheat and, and uh, or sift and, and out of the chaff bring the wheat and your endeavors to do good to others, however feeble, are written in his book of remembrance. Read that last chapter of the book of Malachi and you'll find that the people of God, they got together to talk about the Lord and the things of God. And that chapter says that the Lord hearkened and heard. In fact, I'm told the Hebrew means he bowed his ear right down as those believers got together and they talked about him and about his name. And he says a book of remembrance was written even of those who came to talk together for him. This book of remembrance being written tonight, right now, as hundreds of you have gathered from all over this province and around the corner and up the road, come together for a wee while to study God's Word when you could be in a thousand and one other places. Oh, it's good to see you. Oh, Christian, I know you're hungry. I know that you long to live for your Lord, your very desire, your very presence here. The Lord knows and understands how he loves to see his people come together, not to fight and argue, not to stand up and preach themselves, not to squabble, not to glory in anything of earth, but to glory in the Lord. Surely the Lord is in this place as you have gathered tonight even a weak cup of cold water given in his name and not even in his name given in the name of another Christian just because you love another Christian you were maybe kind to their child or whatever that's what Jesus said it's even as fine as that a cup of cold water given even in the name of his disciple will not be without its reward he doesn't forget your labor of love however little the world may regard it Sure, what do they regard? Here today and gone tomorrow. Would you not rather have God's reward like Moses? Would you not? I love that verse, you know. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. How any father pities his children and loves his children. 
He knows them like nobody else does. Do you think your heavenly Father is any different? I can I ever forget being at Keswick this summer. And in Dick Lucas preaching one evening, telling how he had gone into one of the local stores to buy something. He said preachers like looking for bargains, and I suppose they do. And he said he went in to buy something. And he said a Jewish man came in with his little prayer cap on and his little boy. And the little boy was at one end of the shop and his dad was up at the other end. Suddenly the little child saw something that he wanted to draw his father's attention to. And right there in that shop in Keswick, right in the summer of 86, he shouted at the top of his voice across the shop, Abba! And Dick Lucas just bowed his heart and worshipped. Abba, Father, we approach Thee, and of course we approach You in the Savior's precious name. Abba, Father, dear Father, my Father, Father, Abba, not a denomination, not a sect, not a list of rules, Abba. My heavenly Father. And as you pity your children, sir, so does he pity you. When you cry, it touches him. When you rejoice, he rejoices with you. He knows your pains and your sorrows. He is your heavenly Father. And if we, if we as fathers know how to give good gifts to our children... And my kids' birthdays this week, and when you have twins, you sure got to wreck your brains, folks. You got to make no mistakes, I can tell you. Sometimes you even have to go double. You have to think long and hard. What will I get them? I remember watching my first child being born. And you know, it's awful crazy. The things come in your head. She was just born. You know what I thought as I was standing there weeping at the wonder of it? I thought, I wonder what I'll buy her for Christmas. And I bought her the biggest teddy bear I could get my hands on, and it's still at home there. Yes, I'm not saying that in any pride. Any father would do it. When you become a father, you'll know the joy of it in your heart. We want to buy presents for your children, good presents. And if, if they want bread, will you give them a scorpion or a stone? No. Well, why do you think your heavenly Father doesn't want to give you good gifts? No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. If it's good for you, you'll have it. He's silently planning for you. And as a father finds pleasure even in the least acts of his children, and of course a father does find interest in the least acts of his children, I went along to preach in a school this morning and my kids happened to be there sitting on the floor with dozens of others. And as I sat down getting ready to speak, one of them turned around with a big wink. She winked at me. And then in the next few minutes round, she came again and gave me another wink. And then round again and another wink until, well, I looked away. But you see, you would say, oh, he's all sentimental, he's yucky, he's... Well, you can say what you like, but you see, that little wink from a little child to her father, it's worth a million dollars any day. Why? Because you love your own children, and you have a special relationship with them. Stranger wouldn't know anything about it. Stranger wouldn't even understand. Stranger wouldn't care. No, I was in a home in Wales this weekend. There was a little grandchild came in, and I could see the lady and, and gentleman I was staying with. They worshipped that little child. They absolutely, virtually, well, they virtually worshipped the child. And I thought, my, you know, the Bible says the glory of old men are their children's children. And that's true. It's their glory, the Bible says, a grandchild. They can spoil it rotten and not worry about it. it didn't spoil you, but your grandfather does. You know, and whatever. Father doesn't spoil his children, but he very often, rather, when he becomes a grandfather, spoils his grandchild. 
But you know, then the lady told me how that the little one had nearly died. She told me the history of the child and how ill the child had been and how her son had come home and I had met the son and sat down in the house and said, Oh, Mom, he said, the child has only 12 hours to live. Oh, she said, that child is precious. See, I'm just a stranger. What would I know about the heartache of that family? You see, a, a relationship with a child to its parents, a stranger wouldn't know anything about. And your relationship with your heavenly father, the girls in the office don't understand. Your relationship with Abba Father in heaven, they would think was crazy. They would think it's you're off your head. You're a religious maniac. They would say to you like the great king said to Paul, Paul, you are mad. Much learning doth make you mad. Paul wasn't mad. Lying, facing death, he writes, Henceforth there is led up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. O Christian, from the, my heart, let us never get away from this lovely, lovely relationship we have with God in Christ that is tender and real and as personal as the heartaches and the heartbreaks and the trials of your life. Oh, Christian, was it a, the great theologian? Yes, I was reading about him today. He went preaching and lecturing to famous people around the world, and he came back to Germany, and they said, what was the profoundest thought you had? in that great trip around the world. And he replied, the most profound thought I had was, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Yes, the Lord finds pleasure in our poor, feeble efforts to serve him, and it may well seem incredible to believers and impossible that they can have done anything worth naming on that great day. Yet so it is. Let every believer listening tonight take comfort when the Lord says, I know thy works. He knows all about what you've been doing for him. I find it profoundly humbling. But at the same time, I do find it makes me afraid that there are works in my life which ought not to be there. Notice now that in every epistle, the Lord Jesus makes a promise to the man that overcomes, or the woman. Isn't this lovely? And of course, this is important. Look at it in, in the text. Let's read them again just for the lovely promises. I've expounded them, but let's just read them. 2 and verse 7, to Ephesus. To the man that overcomes at Ephesus, what does he say? To the person who overcomes, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That is, very simply, you'll enjoy eternal life. Look at Smyrna, chapter 2, verse 17. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone. You remember all the lovely symbolism of the white stone and what it meant? Friendship and acquittal and so on. And in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. Look at Thyatira, ch uh, 26 of chapter 2. He that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. That's future administration with Christ. Shall rule with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter, shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, and I will give him the morning star. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I'll not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Chapter 3, verse 12. There we have it again. In that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. And I will write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. Isn't that just beautiful? 
Again and again and again you have it. Verse 21, even to the Laodiceans, whom he couldn't commend for anything. Chapter 3, 21, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And the Spirit is saying to the churches, Christians, you've got to be overcomers. I want to talk straight about this. Are you an overcomer? Am I an overcomer? All right, all right. You respect the Bible, that's good, and you respect its doctrines, and you say prayers, that's good. But how are you going in the battle? That's it. How are you going in the battle for God in these days? Are you overcoming temper? Bad temper. You're overcoming it. You're overcoming desires that would break out in your heart for things that are evil and wrong. Are you resisting the devil? And are you resisting the world? There's no middle course. Christians are to be overcoming Christians. That is the par paramount message of the seven letters. Every time, overcomers. You've got to be overcomers. You must... Fight the good fight of faith. You must endure hardships for the cause of Christ. You must make up your mind that it will be for you, if you really live for God, a daily struggle. Thinking of these poor guys lying down here at my feet. Must be sore, fellas, all this. Lord bless you. A real struggle sitting on those hard metal steps or whatever. But true. Isn't it? Isn't it tremendous? How that in these days, there are so many Christians who don't realize that it is a struggle. And they don't really want to be overcomers. See, the cross is the way of conflict. The way of conflict. Abraham, didn't he have to overcome the love of security? Didn't I tell you about the meeting recently in Scotland with a professor from Liverpool University who was the archaeologist? Never forget it. He showed us slides. He showed us slides of Ur of the Chaldees at the time Abraham left it. And I can tell you they were very sophisticated. And then he showed us slides of the nomads and nomadic life. And he showed us what Abraham left. And he gave up security. Come on, Abraham, out of thy country, out of thy kindred, away from that. You're going to go to a city whose foundation I have built, and I have made it. I'm not telling you all the details, but come on, out you come. And he left everything, and away went. All the sophistication of Ur of the Chaldees to become a nomad, following a God who hadn't told him all the details. Oh, what a man. By faith he did it, setting out across the desert for God, even letting Lot go down the well-watered plain. Wonderful, isn't it? He overcame the love of security. We all love security. We all love to hug the coastline. We hate controversy or whatever, don't we? We don't, we don't want to, to have to face any persecution or whatever for the cause of the Lord. How we hate it. How we hug security. But then, of course, the way of the cross is the way of conflict. We're crucified with Christ. We have no plans of our own. A crucified man doesn't have any plans of his own. Abraham, he overcame the love of security. My friend, is your security being taken away from you? Your job. Maybe you were engaged to somebody and she jilted you for somebody else. Maybe there's some girl here tonight and some fella jilted you for somebody else. And you had all your hopes and your plans and your dreams pinned in him. And he's gone. And the door was shut and he's away and he'll not be back. And you're sitting in this class tonight, broken up inside. It's very real to you. Your security gone. God said to Abraham, look, Abraham, I... I'm thy exceeding great reward. I am thy shield. Huh? Is that enough? That's enough. I don't know, maybe your business is cracking around you. 
you're frightened out of your mind. The bank won't loan you anymore. You're in trouble, deep trouble. Many thousands are, can't even make their mortgages or whatever. And you're sitting here frightened tonight with no security. Oh, my friend, I don't know how God will do it and what he will use, but you live for him and be honest before him and do, as, as the word says, as occasion serves you, putting the Lord first, acknowledging him in all your ways, and you'll find he'll bring you through. Don't just give up because security's been taken away. I find when God called me to this work, he took all my props away. I had props set up. And I'll never forget the night the job went. And I had to launch out by faith on this work. And I remember it was the loneliest night I think I have ever lived in my life. And I don't ever want to have to live it again. And I thought, there ain't no hope for me. How will we ever get through? And yet all I can do tonight is testify to this, that if God takes your secure props away, he'll put his promises in the place of those props, and he will hold you. And the waters may rise around you, but they'll not drown you. Why, said Evangeline both as she was dying, the waters are rising, but I am not sinking. And maybe that's where you are tonight. Think of Machia. He overcame the love of ease. Remember, he refused to prophesy smooth things to King Ahab. Maybe you've had to tell the truth to somebody and it hurt. Well, he wouldn't give him smooth words when other words were necessary. He overcame the love of ease. What about Daniel? Look at that fellow, fabulous position, a president in the land, brilliant academic, university training, you name it, he had it. He had prowess and intellectual ability. He was a great administrator, a powerful civil servant. That nation was depending on him for guidance. And what happened? Look, you're going into a den of lions. And as a friend of mine often says, there's a difference between a lion's den and a den of lions. And so there is. You could have a lion's den and no lions in it. He went into a den of lions. My, I was at a zoo during the summer with my children, you know, and one of them was acting Egypt with a lion, with the cage between, of course. And she was fooling about with this lion, not realizing its power, and suddenly it roared. I can see that kid. I can see her yet. I still keep her going about it when that lion roared. Wow! She nearly went clean out of her skin almost. It was incredible. She just thought it was a big pussycat, really, until he roared. Oh, I can see it. And I laughed. And I thought of Daniel at the time. I thought, poor Daniel, what was it like for that brilliant man? He overcame the fear of death. Are you scared of dying? I am. I am. I'm scared of dying. I'm not scared of where it'll take me. I'm scared of dying. I don't know anybody who isn't. If you have met him, would you introduce me to him? The article of death is a fearful thing. But where it takes you, if you're a believer, how different that is. Yes, there's fear in death, but Jesus takes it away. Oh, how lovely that Daniel overcame the fear of death. And I'm sure that he was trembling in his heart as they took him to throw him in to those lions. But he trusted God, and God just shut the lion's mouth so they could not harm him overcome the fear of death. He can give you power so that when you are afraid, even of death, you can become an overcomer. When you are afraid of lack of security, you can become an overcomer. When you love ease and you have to speak words of truth that hurt to help, you can become an overcomer. Matthew got up from the receipt of custom and he overcame the love of money 
and he followed Jesus. And Mary brought her ointment, and she poured it out at the Savior's feet, and she overcame the fear of man. The afraid of man, she overcame it. Saul gave up all his prospects of preferment as a great academic in his day with the Hebrew people. He gave it up, and he overcame, and he preached the very Jesus that he had persecuted. And he overcame the love of man's praise. What was the secret of their victory? Faith. They believed on Jesus, and in believing they were made strong. They believed, and he held them up. And in all their battles, they kept their eyes on Jesus. And he never left them, and he never forsook them, and they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. You and I, let us resolve tonight what these next months will hold. God only knows what these next months will hold. For Northern Ireland, God only knows. God only knows what's going to happen to us, where it's all going to go. But let us, as humble believers in Christ, let us be overcomers. Remember that pair of Quill and Priscilla? Government made a very nasty, nasty, nasty order that all Jews had to leave, and some of them just sneaked and hid on the other side of the Tiber until the emperor forgot his law and went back in, but not a Quill and Priscilla. A nasty government law meant they were unemployed. You know, they were tent makers, and every Roman soldier carried a tent on his back when he went on marching, went marching on a campaign. And they were put out of Rome, very difficult thing for a tent maker. And they were poor. And when they were at Corinth, Paul joined them there, and they were all poor together, for poor Paul, the Christians had forgotten about him too, and he had to go and make tents to get a bit of money together to keep his body and soul together. I often think of Nicholson when somebody said to him, Ah, oh, you get paid for preaching, don't you? No, no, he said, I don't. I get paid, he says, between preaching. A lot of truth in that. And it's true, that's per Paul. He had to go and make tents so that between preaching he could keep alive. And they were all poor together, but what happened? As a result of that nasty edict by that government that looked absolutely ridiculous and that was racist and biased against the Jews and so on and the Christians. Nevertheless, that couple made their tents and went to Ephesus and they established a church in their house and Timothy was there and Apollos, that brilliant orator from North Africa, came. And of course, they heard him in the synagogue and instructed him in the things of God. And he became such a mighty, powerful young man for God. And that pair, Aquila and Priscilla, became the thing that was the couple that was used by God to stitch the whole lovely, lovely tapestry together. They were the weaver's beam, in a sense. In a sense, going back and forward across, people coming in to their home and coming to that church, and they encouraged them. And all over the Roman world, they were probably the most famous of all Christian couples. And it was a nasty edict that put them there. See, God can use things that, are, that seem awful and seem terrible and unfair. And in the midst of it all, he can use it to bring about his purposes for the extension of his kingdom. And if they send you to Enniskillen or send you to Ballyslockmagutry or they send you to Saudi or they send you to wherever, and you say, look, those fellas up in the head office, what do they mean by sending me there? And so on. Don't be too mad at them. Remember that all things that happen to you are not good, but they work together for good. They work together for good. And that couple overcame unemployment. 
And I mean, we could go on again and again. We see it. They were overcoming Christians, and many, many Christians in them, you know, there's very little sign. There's very little sign of fighting, unfortunately, and much less sign of victory in these days, and they never strike. It seems one stroke on the side of Christ, and they're at peace with the Lord's enemies. And they have no quarrel with sin. That's not the way of Christianity. It's not the way to heaven. And of course, we can be well versed in the sound of doctrine and in sound doctrine and dead to its power. And I fear lest your Christian life should sink and mine should sink into just little vague talk about our own weaknesses and our own corruption and a few sentimental expressions about Christ, while real, practical, powerful, overcoming Christian living, victory in Jesus, overcoming evil, overcoming pressure, overcoming temper, overcoming lust, overcoming envy, overcoming jealousy, overcoming division, overcoming the devil by the power of Christ, resisting him, and he'll flee from us. An overcoming Christian, look at it again and again and again and again and again. To the overcomer, I will give, I will give, I will give, I will give, I will give. He'll help you to be an overcomer. Practical fighting on Christ's side, you know, is altogether neglected. Why, says James, be doers of the word and not hearers only. When God wants to drill a man, as applies to a woman too, and thrill a man and skill a man. When God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world shall be amazed to watch his methods, and watch his ways, how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, how he hammers him and hurts him, and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay which only God understands, while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks when his good he undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses, and with every purpose fuses him, by every act induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. I love a tree. I love a brave upstanding tree. When I am wearied in the strife, beaten by storms and bruised by life, and I look up at a tree and it refreshes me. If it can keep its head held high and look the storms straight in the eye, ready to stand, ready to die, then by the grace of God can I at least with heaven's help, I'll try. I love a tree, for it refreshes me. I love a tree when it seems dead, when its leaves all shorn and bared its head, when winter flings its cold and snow, and it stands there undismayed by woe. It stands there waiting for the spring. A tree is such a believing thing. I love a tree, for it oft refreshes me. May you be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth your fruit in its season. And may every one of you be mighty overcomers, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Father,
Thank you for this time together, and bless your word to all our hearts. Thank you, Father, for these messages. As we have them in your word, we're not to leave our first love for Christ. We're not to expect to escape suffering. We're not to divorce faith and works. We're not to try to worship false gods. We're not to be hypocrites. We're not to underestimate your power, and we must never be lukewarm. Thank you for teaching us all these lessons, and help us now, Lord, all of us, by your grace, to be overcomers. We pray for Jeffrey Archer tonight, Lord, for there ain't too many in this nation praying for him. And we pray he'll find the Savior, and he'll come to know the Lord, and we think of thousands like him, men with great brains, but open to temptation. And there but for the grace of God go we. And Lord, all around us, there are people who are going down under. And they're not overcomers, because they don't know the Savior. And we will go the same way if we don't watch ourselves, in that we can miss God's best and we can have a saved soul and a wasted life. Lord, there are many temptations as we have seen this week. Wicked, evil minds. And that devil would seek to bring all these Christian folk in front of me tonight down. And Lord, that devil would love to wreck this Tuesday night work. And he'd love to divide us and he'd love to split us. And he'd love to create anything just in order to stop the word going out with power. Oh, God, we would pray tonight as we have seen others go down under evil in this very week. Lord, help us by thy grace alone to be overcomers. Lord, may this work go on from strength to strength. And if we've had good times in these letters, may we have even better times as we look at this mighty man of God. And in this run-up to Christmas in your will, Lord, may it be the greatest time we've ever known. We think of this church. Bless every member of it, every leader in it. Bless every church represented here tonight. And Lord, in these days, just remind us that we must be very careful to do it, as un do, our, do Christian service as unto the Lord, and that nothing is insignificant. May the churches, the true Bible-believing churches of Ulster, may they in these days know a quickening. And those that profess your name and don't preach the word, and that are dead and don't preach the gospel, convert the men and women in it and turn them from being cold into boiling hot. And those churches that are lukewarm, may they not be spat out of your mouth, Lord, but may they rather warm up as they get back to the Lord and to his word. You have spoken now, Lord, and he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. And God's people said a final. Amen.